So the way that it works is that these are the different phases in a turn. These are the different steps within a turn, right? So the simple way to understand that is just that, maybe I made this too big. The simple way to understand that is again, like the example that I mentioned before, where it's like chess. So while it's my turn, all these things are going to happen, right? But at the same exact time, whatever I choose to do in every one of these points, my opponent has a choice to do something as well. The only thing is certain steps behave differently depending on whose turn it is. That's really the only thing that kind of separates it. So I can show this easier over here. So this is realistically what happens. See, so this says your turn, this says opponent's turn. This is just the settings prompting, like when you want to be prompted in general. Um, I just, I prefer, most players prefer to be prompted at every given point because you can do a lot of stuff overall. So the simple way to break it down is simply that, let's say it's my turn, right? Because it's your, it's your turn, you're going first in every step. It's my turn, so I would do something here. I, I would choose to not do something here. I'm just being vague, vague about it, and then I can explain it better afterwards. Um, but this is the first step, the upkeep. I make my choice whether I want something to happen or not, and then whatever I choose to do, then it's going to prompt my opponent. What would you like to do during this moment? If we both come to the conclusion to move forward, then it goes to the next step, to the draw step. Same thing happens. Whatever happens, happens. Then it's going to ask my opponent. If you both conclude, then you move on to the next one. And it goes back and forth basically relaying the message between you and your opponent, you know? Like you both have the choice to do something, but they just behave differently depending on whose turn it is. So that's how that works. So when it's your turn, this is when certain things will trigger, right? So I guess the simplest way to actually break that down, let me go back to this, because I realized that I started losing even myself. <laughs> I don't think any of these have that. All right, so let me just use a simple example from before. All right, so the way a turn normally works is your untap phase, which is a very, very first step in any turn. And all that that really refers to is just a reset. And I'll explain the details afterwards. All that you should think about is just a reset. Everything goes back to its original form. That's the simplest way to think of it. Now is your upkeep. Upkeep, it's just like a clock hour for a turn. All that this does is just that this particular moment sets off abilities that trigger at the upkeep. So like this, for example. Mana Crypt, at the beginning of your upkeep, you know, blah, 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 a whole bunch of stuff happens. And that's all that it really refers to. Um, let me see, here's another one. This as well has an ability at the beginning of your upkeep, blah, blah, blah. And there's so many cards that have these kinds of effects and abilities. But all that it refers to is that if it has that text at the beginning of your upkeep, it refers to this specific moment. This is when it starts happening, whatever those abilities are. And that's all that that is. Next step is your draw step. If it is your turn, you will draw a card. You cannot avoid this. Of course, unless an ability prevents you or does something, the basic ruling is that this is going to happen. This is your draw step. It's going to happen. Plain and simple. It just will. So you draw a card automatically. However, if it's your turn and this step passes, your opponent is not going to draw a card. If they can do stuff here, like they can cast spells, they can activate abilities if they want, sure. But they would not be drawing a card if it's not their turn. So that's a simple way to think of it. So see, I drew a card. Next is your main phase. So to simply, and I guess the most non-complicated non way to think of the main phase, is just look at all these cards. So you have sorcery, right? You see the subtype here, sorcery, basic land, or just land in general, legendary creature, artifact, land, creature, 
it's a creature um legendary creature the whole point is every single card in the game these are considered spells minus lands Man lands aren't spells but everything else you can only cast them you can literally only cast them during the main phase i'll explain the second one but there are two main phases in a turn and i'll explain this but you can only cast things during these two moments that's the only time you can cast any card the only exception is something called an instant like this see instant what instants are or spells that have flash um, I'll show you so like this one has flash what that means is that you can cast these spells whenever you feel like it so I'm being very literal in the sense that you can only cast all those cards in this main phase moment so it's only on like the default moment of this you see like main phase cast spells activate abilities and play land and that's literally what happens this is when you can cast spells this is normally when most abilities can only trigger and this is also when you can drop a land and i'll go into all this stuff after <laughs> but the whole thing is this is when you can actually do stuff right like i have the freedom to do literally anything and everything but the only thing is let's say let's say i do this right so i drop my land you're permitted to drop one land per your turn so let's say i drop my land and i cast a spell right let's say i do that and I cast a spell and then my opponent tries to cast something to negate that spell if i have no other instance but i had something that let me you know protect it i would not be able to do anything about it simply because it's not like the core main phase this is happening kind of like in between spells like what's going on on the field the best way to explain it it's like it's kind of just going on between a couple of spells going on right now so it's not the core main phase so unless i had an instant or something that behaved like an instant i would not be able to do anything and that's just the main difference between those spells every single card in the game you can only cast them here in the main phase but instants or spells that have flash like that you can cast them at any given point you can cast them in the main phase if you want you can cast them between spells you can cast them here 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 over here you can cast them at the end step if you want you're free to choose wherever you want to and then that's more or less it right so now i'm just going to do a few things very quickly all right so now let's say I, I go, right, and I want to cast a creature, right, or you want to cast anything in general. Let me, let me actually go over, like, the whole casting thing, just because that's fairly, fairly simple. I was jumping ahead of myself, I'm sorry. <laughs> so you see how this card, Planner Cleansing, you see this number and these icons over here? This is every single card's casting cost. If a card has a casting cost, it will always be up here. See, like Mind Rot, the casting cost is that. For Atomic, the casting cost is that. That's the casting cost, that's the casting cost. What that means is that you must have mana to be able to cast that card within those requirements. So to more or less simply understand mana, mana is the game's currency or your own deck's currency. It's your form of resource. And the way to obtain mana is usually, for the most part, with land. Lands, they're made to produce mana. Literally, lands produce mana. That's like the simplest way to think about it. Lands in general, they produce mana. So they're going to be your very consistent and your usual go-to um, route when it comes to obtaining mana. So there's that. But the thing is, every other card in the game also has the capability of producing mana. It's just whether it's designed to do so or not. So that's just like the only like slight, um, I guess, detail when it comes to it. So now when it comes to casting and knowing how much mana you need, the colors themselves, see like this, you see how it has like three white stars. This one has like one black skull. This one has two white stars. This one just has one black skull. Basically the things that have the color or the things that are not numbers, 
this specifies exactly how many you need of that color. So what this means is that forget this gray number for now. What this means specifically is that I must need three white mana to cast this. This one, I must use one black. This one, I must use two white. The colors specify exactly what you need to pay for it. I must use one black for this. Right? So there's that. So now the difference between the colors and now the numbers. The numbers, you also need to pay as part of the cost. So like with this, for example, I do need three white, right? But I also need three of this gray. What the gray stands for, that's either colorless mana or mana of any color. So to show that again really quickly, um, so like this, it lets me add two colorless. This icon again, this is, this is just representing colorless. So this specifically only produces colorless. So this will produce two, and that's all that it would do. Right, so it produces that too, but I can use that two colorless to start paying for some of this. There's no, um, there's no like layover or rollover mana, really. Like you can't put in like three white for this card and save up for it and then cast it whenever. Whatever the, the card's full cost is, you must pay it in full at the time that you want to cast it. You can't just like put it away. <laughs> um... So, so yeah, that's what that is. So this again, it requires three white, three white specifically, and three of any color or three colorless. You literally are free to choose whatever you want this value to be, like what you want to consist for this value. With this one, you must have one black to pay for this and two of anything. It can literally be two of anything. It can be two colorless, it can be two black, two white, one black, one white, one red, one blue, two red, it does not matter. You literally are free to choose whatever you want this to be. With this one, it just means three of anything. You can literally use three of whatever you want to cast this. The only exceptions, of course, again, but like before, is when it has a color to it. It has to specifically be that. So like right now, to kind of explain like what you can do like on my turn and what you can or can't cast. Right now, sea planes, they produce white. Swamps, they produce black. This one has this really cool thing where it can produce either or. It's not a basic land. But look, it's, it can produce either white or black. So it lets me choose which one I want to do. So in this situation, I can do several things. And to explain to you how I can do several things and why I would do several things. So, like I mentioned before, lands produce mana. That's just what they're designed to do, right? But lands are not your only source of mana. Other things can produce mana. Creatures can produce mana. Sorceries, instants, they can make mana. Enchantments can produce mana. Artifacts can produce mana. The reason why I'm mentioning that is that this is another one, like so. This is an artifact that can also produce mana. So, the reason why mana is so good is if you can kind of gather it even now, just by not knowing much of it, the more mana you have, the more that you can cast, the more things that you're free to do. So naturally, the more mana that you have is what you really want to go for. You want to have as much as you can. So that you're free to do a lot of things. You're not limited. Because the thing is, when you tap for mana, and I'll explain all this tapping all that stuff, when you use up your land's mana or any resources, like when you use up the mana itself, that's, it's gone for the remainder of the turn. You know, like, and that's kind of what I'm, what I'm going to be explaining here. So like, let's say I have this, right? I have two white and one black, or a total, a cumulative of three. So I only have, you can think of it like dollars if you want to. Um, I only have three dollars to spend to cast something. So I can either cast something for three. Let me see, like this costs two of anything and one black, but it's a total of three, so I can cast this. This total that's in the, in the game, it's called converted mana cost or CMC. See the CMC for this is three because it's two of anything plus one black, it's a total of three. This is a CMC of two, it's just two white. This is a CMC of three because it literally just says three. 
this is a CMC of one. So the whole thing is, if you want to think of it like dollars, I have a total of three dollars, so I either can only cast one thing for those three dollars, if you want to think of it that way, or I can cast something for two as well as cast something for one for a total of three. So that's more or less where the strategy comes in. It depends on what you're able to cast and what you should or you shouldn't cast, like in those aspects. And that's just glossing it over. So the whole reason why I was mentioning the whole mana thing is that sometimes you can have things stack and you can sort of combo with certain things. So like, for example, see like this, this costs three. So this would technically use up everything. Same with this. This would technically use up everything once it takes effect, right? Because it costs a total of three. But now this thing has the perk where let's say it casts this, right? It does cost a three, sure. But being that it's a mana source, see, I can use it to actually access even more mana. So I can cast something again, like let's say I want to cast this. I can't cast this, and I'll explain why afterwards, but you know, then you would have the ability to do that. And then that's more or less it. So as you saw, I had to turn these things sideways, right? So then that's how we got the mana. When you turn things sideways, it's called tapping. Or when any card in general is sideways, it's, it's called tapped. And that's what it means. Tapped means sideways. When lands are tapped, they cannot produce any mana. And the whole reason for that is that for a land to produce mana, you have to tap it. You have to turn it sideways for it to produce mana. So because it's already tapped, you can't undo that unless something lets you. But like this, it's stuck like this. Anything that's tapped will stay tapped up until your next untap step or until something lets you. But untap is usually the default. This occurs at the very beginning of your turn. So like, let's say it's my turn right now, right? Like it, like it is and I did all this and I cast that, all my stuff that is tapped, it's going to stay tapped all through this, all through the end, then it's going to be my opponent's turn. My stuff is still going to stay tapped because it's, it's my it's opponent's turn, they're going, and then once they're done and it's back to my turn, back to my untap, that's when things go back to normal. So that's, I'm explaining all this to sort of like give you guys a better understanding as to like the flow of everything and sort of like why you want to plan ahead and be more strategic with it or how the strategy comes into play. So then that's that, right? So I'll just let this go back so you can see it. Let's say it went back into my turn automatically just because I'm playing by myself, but then it's the untap, right? So then these go back to normal. So now, initially, when I tap this, like I mentioned before, planes, they produce white, swamps, they produce black. And that's normally how it works, and that's what they're supposed to do. And then this one could produce either one, right? Either white or black. This is where things start bending the rules, and just about every single card in the game will bend the rules. Um, so the reason why I explained everything in the past was just to explain the core laws of the game, so you could just maneuver around it. So now when I drop this, you saw how before I could tap it for a mana source, right? I could tap it for whatever I want. I can produce mana with this, even though it's not a land. So I can do that. But it also has this perk of while it's out, it says lands I control have tap add one mana of any color. So this changes my land. So long as this thing is out, what it did is that it changed my land so that it can still produce the white, but now it can also produce anything else as well, should I want to. So that's how cards will start to bend rules. Like they'll do stuff like that. You know, sometimes it'll be indefinite so long as it's still out, or it'll be just for a turn, or it'll be just for a moment. You know, but it'll it'll mention all of that. Uh, but yeah, so that's more or less like the basis of it. So let me just cast. I'm trying to think what I was getting at, but there really wasn't anything. So I spent the two white, right? I can't actually undo it. But basically, I tapped for two white so I can cast this, right? Because I need two white to cast this card. This spirally thing here, this is called summoning sickness. And summoning sickness, it only refers to creatures. 
So look like this creature, right? This is an artifact. This is an enchantment. This is an instant. This is a sorcery. This is a sorcery, right? But now look, creature, right? Creature, unicorn. <laughs> Summoning sickness, it only refers to creatures. And what that means is that when you drop that creature, on basically when it's initially out, it will always have summoning sickness, meaning that it cannot attack up until your next turn. So it is vague with that, simply because of the way that you can bend the rules. So remember how I mentioned that your main phase or your main step, this is where you're able to cast everything, right? And it's still true. This is when you cast creatures. There are other spells and abilities that will let you sneak things in or that will let you quote unquote, well, it's really sneaky. It's not really casting. Um, sometimes you can, but sometimes you can cast a creature, you know, outside of these steps, outside of your turn. So the whole reason why, why I'm mentioning that is that let's say this is my opponent's turn and it's the end step of my opponent's turn. If I cast my creature right there, you know, because I, I had an ability that let me do so, then their turn ends and now it's my turn and now my creature can attack. Like it feels almost immediately and it kind of is because it was immediate. Um, so that's where that happens. Whereas if you do it normally, like how I'm doing right now, I cast it during my main phase, right? It has summoning sickness. So throughout the rest of all of this, it cannot attack. It's the end step. Now it's my opponent's turn. And it still can't do anything. It still can't attack. You can still block with your creature, but it's still in its summoning sickness mode up until my next turn starts. And now it doesn't have this anymore. So this visual is really just for the digital version. Um, you don't actually need it. You can kind of just gather which creatures have summoning sickness just because they're the ones that entered the battlefield right there and there. Um, so that's what that is. When you have summoning sickness or when a creature has summoning sickness, they cannot attack. And also, they cannot use tap abilities. So you remember how I was mentioning all the tapping stuff, right? You saw how this, if I tap it normally, I can produce one white. But now this card, it changed its ability so I can tap it. And now instead of producing one white, I can produce anything. The whole thing is it still is a tap ability. Right? Same with this. This arrow, this icon is a tap ability. What this card does, this is a creature, right? And she also has a tap ability. And the tap says destroy target creature. A great, great effect. Like it's, it's a great tool to have. The only thing is summoning sickness affects this as well. If a creature has summoning sickness, they cannot attack until your next turn, and they cannot activate these abilities until that summoning sickness is away. So those are like the real, the only restrictions when it comes to summoning sickness. And the reason why I'm mentioning restrictions is that there is, not there is, but there are several differences. I'm trying to think of a good card. I would have to so you see like this this is just a cost I pay one green and I get to regenerate another target elf I'll explain all the stuff but I get to pay one green to do this this itself and even the second one it doesn't require me to tap so if I drop this creature and it has so many sickness yes it cannot attack but also it can use these abilities because they're not tapping. So this creature is free to use this. Or you as a player, you're free to use these abilities because the creature is not required to tap. So it would not affect this. So that's sort of like the like the rulings in that sense. And that's all that there really is to it. So after that, after your main phase and you do all your shit, right? You, throw out whatever you want, um, or you hold back because you want to wait till combat. I'll explain combat right now, but you wait till all the combat is done. Excuse me. And then you want to finalize what you want to do for your turn. Then you can do that as well. 
But after the first main phase, there is begin combat. And begin combat is more or less the same exact thing like the upkeep. It's just a time where things trigger. Uh, see, at the beginning of combat, see, this one specifies on your turn. Sometimes things say at the beginning of the combat phase or a combat phase, meaning that, you know, for any turn. Like the game, like the cards usually specify whether it's your turn, your opponent's turn, any turn, it'll specify it. But like with this, for example, at the beginning of combat on your turn, that whole lingo refers to this portion right here. This is when those kinds of abilities will set off. At the beginning of combat, it'll all go off right over here. So then all those things will take effect, right? This normally wouldn't happen. I'm just doing this just for example purposes. But okay, so it goes off. Now it's the attack phase, right? This is, if, if it's your turn, you're the one that's going to be attacking. So this is where you declare attackers. One, if you want to declare attackers, whether you don't want to declare attackers, how many creatures do you want to be attacking, and whether or not you even have creatures to attack with. Right? So that's how that works. On default, your creatures will be attacking the player directly. You don't get to target creatures. Whenever you assign attackers, they are on default automatically attacking the opposing player. That's just how it works. So you select them, and when you declare an attacker, they will turn sideways. The act of attacking, the act of attacking will tap a creature. And the reason why that's crucial is that one, tapped creatures cannot block. If this creature was still upright, just like these, you know, like if it was upright on the on the field, it could block. But because it's tapped, it cannot. So a creature doesn't necessarily have to be attacking. You know, it could have entered the battlefield tapped if something caused it. Or an ability that my opponent has could have caused it to be tapped. It doesn't necessarily matter. The simple action, or yeah, it's really just a simple action of a creature being tapped, it prevents it from being able to block. And also, back to Basara, if she was tapped, if she was turned sideways, it would prevent her from using this tap ability again, or even at all. Let's say she didn't get a chance to use it yet. So, if they're already tapped, same thing like with the lands, like when I was explaining before, if the land was tapped, you can't undo it. You have to wait for your untapped phase. So, for creatures, it stops them from using their tapped abilities. They can't use it again, you know, up until they're untapped, and they can no longer block. So that's what happens to tapped and or attacking creatures. So then, after you declare whoever you want to be attacking, then it's your opponent's block turn, or their block phase. So, they choose whether they want a creature to even block this, whether they even have a creature to block this, or let's say they have the creature but they don't want to block it, then they just let it come through. And then it deals direct damage to the opponent. Like, let's say no one was able to block it, so now it hit me. So. It's called assigning blockers. Like if this creature was attacking and then my opponent were to literally assign a blocker, that's what would happen in a block phase. Then you both come to an agreement, like um, like the blocker, like the opponent is blocking, you know, they'll be like, yeah, that's what I want to do. And then it comes to the damage phase. Because nothing dealt damage at this moment just yet. Damage is where the creatures will clash, where they'll just collide, and damage will be done, and or that's when a creature actually does damage to the player if it wasn't blocked. So that's what happened here. That's how I lost my two life because of this damage phase right here. Then it comes to end of combat, which again will set off other abilities or spells that say at the end of combat, such and such happens. So that's what happens over here. And then that's the end of combat and now it's the main phase again. So now if you wanted to cast stuff, you can cast stuff. If you didn't drop land that you, that you didn't want the opponent to know that you had before for whatever reason, now you can drop the land. You know, and just just do things again the same way as here, but more so kind of like a, a recollection of what just happened in a way. Right, so that's how that works. And then over here is the end step. And this is 
like the final part of a turn and this is when abilities will trigger again where cards will say at the beginning of the end step or at the beginning of your end step or the beginning of your opponent's end step but it'll specify the end step itself this is when that goes off and then whatever abilities it has you know they'll kick in and they'll they'll happen and then clean up you see how these things have little arrows like a little white triangle underneath this is because these are the phases of a turn where you're permitted to do something clean up and untap these just happen by default within the game system no player is really allowed to literally do anything here like nothing will happen for you like whatsoever um but cleanup is essentially sort of just like it's more so cleansing like the end of a match 